असीम विद्यार्थी सर हु इज गिविंग लाइव सेशन ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ इन्शुरस एक्ट इट इज इंडीड माय प्लेजर इट इज इंडीड माय प्लेजर टू इंट्रोड्यूस एडवोकेट असीम विद्यार्थी सर सर स्टूड इन फर्स्ट क्लास इन थ्री इयर्स एल एल पी कोर्स विच ई परस्यूड फ्रॉम जितेंद्र चौहान कॉलेज ऑफ लॉ इन मुंबई एंड एनरोल्ड एज एन एडवोकेट विथ बार काउंसिल ऑफ महाराष्ट्र एंड गोवा इन द इयर टू थाउजेंड वन प्रायर टू दैट इन नाइनटीन नाइनटी सेवन सर हेज कंप्लीटेड हिज सी ए सर इज प्रैक्टिसिंग एडवोकेट बिफोर द बॉम्बे हाईकोर्ट एंड स्पेशलाइज इन आर्बिट्रेशन लॉ कमर्शियल सूट्स रीड पिटिशन इंक्लूडिंग चैलेंज ऑफ अवॉर्ड पास बाय इंश्योरेंस ऑब्जमेंट before bombay high court and supreme court of india other than this sir has also appeared in various matters related to consumer disputes before national state and district consumer forums tax matters before itat sir also handled criminal cases before magistrate courts sessions court and high court sir is also in academic field sir is visiting faculty at kirit mehta school of law N I M I M S at Mumbai, Pravin Gandhi College of Law, Mumbai, M B A Law in N M I M S. Sir is also visiting faculty at Institute of Chartered Accounts of India. Sir is successfully conducting induction program on consumer law for L I C of India since last twenty years, and also actively conducted seminars and webinars and consumer conferences in Maharashtra for president and members of consumer courts in Maharashtra. I request sir to take the charge and guide us on the topic of insurance act. Thank you. Thank you very much for a generous introduction. Uh, at the very outset, I express my gratitude to our esteemed chairperson and office bearers of Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa, Advocate Shri Milin Patil, chairperson, Advocate Shri Sangram Desai, vice chairman, Shri Jain Jaybave, member BCI. and our coordinator dr uday varun ji ke uh, who is also our esteemed president of consumer courts uh, advocate association i will also thank uh, every participant for attending this uh, lecture series and it's a pleasure to be part of this lecture series online lecture series uh, today's lecture will uh, predominantly focus on insurance act 1938 and the dimensions uh, of insurance as a measure of indemnity and guarantee uh of course the insurance act has to be seen in the context of consumer protection act 2019 now we have around the insurance act will contain around 123 uh, sections out of which the relevant sections in terms of consumer disputes will be very few maybe six or seven sections which will be very pertinent for us to discuss today and uh, before i you know embark into our discussions for consumer uh, litigation qua insurance uh, contracts uh, as uh, dr varun jigar has also said that insurance disputes uh, comprises before a consumer fora or consumer commissions uh, more than you know 15 to 20 percent so you know there is substantial insurance litigation before consumer commissions and therefore it is but it's significant for us to understand the nuances of uh, our consumer litigation and consumer contracts so you know everyone you know we must have heard this term this phrase insurance is a subject matter of solicitation you know every advertisement every insurance contract will contain this kind of a you know disclaimer this is a disclaimer this essentially means that the insurance has to be requested or asked for and it cannot be sold now this phrase which is uh, uh, often been used in all advertisements is mandated by the regulator called irda that is insurance regulatory development authority which was formed under the irda act 1999 it basically means that insurance is a product that is being sold by this advertisement and not anything else the the intention behind this is to prevent advertisements from being misleading and trying to you know trick the consumers into buying insurance while advertising something else so if you have seen any advertisements of insurance and i'm sure we must have seen you may not have missed this disclaimer because it has been prominently been displayed in all the advertisements as a consumer this disclaimer 
or a warning or a caveat is of utmost importance, but often being ignored. And uh, if you see the dictionary meaning of solicitation means you have to ask for. It means that consumers or customers have to ask for an intermediary who will then guide him accordingly to select the best available product. Therefore, insurance should not be sold, but solicited. So this is what the insurance is. Now, before entering into the discussion of Insurance Act and the relevant provisions, the important provisions, so far as consumer litigation is concerned, at the very outset, we should understand the categorization of insurance contracts. Now, we have life insurance contracts, we have general insurance contracts, we have health insurance contracts, health has been given a special status now, and we have reinsurance contracts. So out of this, the first three are very important because that comprises of major litigation disputes, consumer disputes before uh, various commissions. So life insurance contract, of course, life insurance contract is a contract of guarantee. What is written on the policy document is a guarantee which the beneficiary or the survivor gets at the end of the contract, depending on the class of contract or type of contract being taken. Whereas general insurance contract are contract of indemnity. So uh, insured, a policyholder has to be put in the same position as he was before the date of incident, you know, provided the peril is covered under the contract, nothing more and nothing less. So it is a contract of indemnity. And this has been recently been settled by the Supreme Court of India uh, in the case of uh, National Insurance Company versus Harsolia Motors. This is the judgment delivered by the Supreme Court of India on 13th April. Now settling the long, you know, pending dispute of commercial entities. So equally important is that it is a contract of indemnity, general insurance. That means whatever, you know, whichever form you have incurred a loss, which is covered under the insurance contract, the insurance company is obliged to put you back in the same position. No profit element is involved. And therefore, even commercial entities who are, you know, uh, buying this particular insurance contracts or insurance policies are also consumers who are the insurance company. Now, this is something which is an exception to the rule of definition of consumer because commercial entities are excluded from the purview of consumer uh, definition of consumer, but insurance contract now becomes an exception. Now, this has been now uh, settled by the Supreme Court and therefore, uh, the, the, there is no question about, you know, uh, taking a defense of commercial purpose any further because even a commercial entity, a large scale of commercial entities who may employ 1,000 or 2,000 employees, they still are consumer against an insurance company under an insurance contract. So now let us come to the relevant provisions of the Insurance Act. Now relevant provisions essentially would be section 45, which is the charging section of the entire Insurance Act. The entire consumer litigation, especially under life insurance contract, is based on section 45. The defenses which are raised by the insurance company are qua section 45 before a consumer commissions. And therefore it is relevant for us to understand what is section 45, what is the amendment which has come in 2014, made effective from 2015, and what is a situation which was existing prior to 2014 and post 2015, because there's a major change now when we look at reputation letters or rejection letters made by life insurance companies. Now, I'll just caution you that this is in terms of life insurance contract. So section 45 is something which comprises of 98% of litigation across India under you know, insurance contracts. So let us understand this, this. The first thing is the basic principle of insurance law is that a contract of insurance is based on utmost good faith. Ubrima fides, that is a Latin phrase we always use. And in fact, it is a fundamental basis upon which all contracts of insurance are made. Now, Ubrima fides refers to, as I said, Latin phrase, meaning utmost good faith and is a cornerstone or a bedrock of an insurance contract. Now, this is a fundamental defense, the basic defense and a primary objection which will be taken by an insurance company while adjudicating a dispute or defending themselves before a consumer forum. Because this is this means that the policyholder or the, the person who has possibly died 
has breached the you know the principle of utmost good faith so you all are aware that the in, in any insurance dispute the first basic document the fundamental document is a proposal form and an application form whatever is written in that proposal form or an application form is taken on the face of it as true and correct by the insurance company and based on which a insurance contract is entered and a policy is given to the policy holder but what happens if on the happening of any incident under a life insurance contract something is found which is something is found by the insurance company which was missing in the proposal form or not disclosed by the proposer at the time of entering the proposal form this means the defense raised by the insurance company would be that the proposer has breached the basic principle of tenant of the insurance is utmost good faith and therefore which warrants a repudiation of a claim now please understand this has been amended in 2014 in the insurance act it's a major amendment december 2014 we had various amendments in the insurance act itself and one of the sections which were amended was section 45 now we need to understand what was the situation pre amendment and post amendment now the pre amendment era will be that a section 45 will start with the wording of policy not to be called in question on the ground of this statement after 2 years so what was the position prior to 2014 because there are matters which are still pending before various uh, consumer commissions of uh, you know the uh, uh, policies which are issued prior to 2014 and therefore pre amendment will be applicable and the complaints which are freshly filed post 2015 would be obviously governed by the amended act so the the position is policy not to be called in question after 2 years in case of a misstatement meaning i cannot question a policy a claim lodged after 2 years uh, from the date of commencement of the policy but there are certain exceptions made out i can still repudiate a claim i can question a policy after 2 years provided i satisfy three conditions condition number 1 the statement must be on a material matter and must suppress material fact which was material to disclose meaning that the proposer ought to have known this and ought to have disclosed it may in respect of his health it may be in respect of his occupation it may be in respect of his income also we call it as a financial underwriting so all these three aspects which is to his knowledge and he gives a disclosure which is incorrect this becomes a material matter and material matter has been time and again expressed by the supreme court explained by the supreme court that what is material the test is had he disclosed this material fact i would not insured him or i would have charged him extra premium that is what is called as a test of materiality if it's a material matter or if he suppresses material facts which was material to disclose that is the first condition and the onus is on insurance company to prove the second condition if you want to repudiate a claim after 2 years will be suppression must be fraudulently made by the policy holder again the onus is on the insurance company to prove this and the third one is the policy holder must have known at the time of making the statement that it was false or it suppressed material facts which it was material to disclose meaning these three conditions should be satisfied if a insurance company wants to repudiate a claim after a gap of 2 years so if i issue a policy let us say i issued a policy in 2012 i can easily repudiate a claim within 2 years i need not satisfy this condition but if you want to repudiate a claim after 2 years which the policy period crosses 2 years then i need to satisfy these three conditions i'll repeat it it should be a material matter it should be fraudulently made and it was known to the policy holder that he was making a false statement these three conditions have to be satisfied if the if the insurance company wants to repudiate the claim after 2 years this was the scenario pre amendment that is prior to 26th march 2015 which is the date of notification now what was the situation after post amendment now this is really interesting post amendment has seen completely changed the scenario now the post amendment says that you cannot call in a policy a question in a policy on any ground after 3 years so after 3 years if a policy has run for 3 years i cannot repudiate a claim 
you know that that is a major change we have so what is this 3 years from this 3 years will start from date of issuance of the policy or date of commencement of risk it can be after date of uh, on a date of rider to the policy whichever is later so it can be date of revival as you all know revival means if a policy is lapsed i don't pay premiums in a policy my policy is lapsed i can't get any benefit out of that policy but i have an option to revive with the consent of the insurance company i go and i revive the policy i pay premiums i revive i, I have to file a declaration of good health and my policy is you know set back yes it's now live existing it is revival obviously this 3 years will start from any of these dates whichever is later so after 3 years now the present law of insurance says that after 3 years a life insurance company cannot repudiate a claim and this 3 years will start from date of insurance of policies date of commencement of risk it can be date of uh, revival or date of a rider whichever is later rider means i have taken an insurance policy a basic cover a term plan now i want a double accident benefit also so i request the insurance company please pass an endorsement and give me a double accident benefit also charge some premium this is called date of rider date of rider to the policy now whichever is later so from this we can figure it out that there is a sea change from what was the existing law of insurance under section 45 and now what is the present law present law says that i cannot reject repudiate a claim after a period of 3 years this is in the context of life insurance contract and not general insurance contracts now for this now to satisfy these conditions the insurer should communicate in writing to the insured or the legal representative or the nominee or the assignees you know the grounds on which the decision is being made so within 3 years i have my right as an insurance company to reject a claim but after 3 years i cannot now there is one more element to this now there is a definition of fraud which is also in the ipc which has been now imported under section 45 also that fraud means what fraud can be of four categorizations suggestive falsity suppressive very or any act fitted to deceive or any omission if the law specifically provides to declare this four conditions are declared as fraudulent so a mere silence is not fraud unless it is depending on the circumstances of the case it is a duty of the insured or his agent to speak or to inform and you know if there is a silence if i ask a question if a doctor is who is examining before issuance of the policy will re request him to you know answer certain questions and if he remains silent this may amount to fraud so no insurer shall repudiate a life insurance policy on the ground of fraud if the insured or the beneficiary can prove that the misstatements was true to the best of his knowledge or there was no you know deliberate intention to suppress or that the misstatement of or suppression of material fact are within the knowledge of the insurer again the onus of disproving is upon the policy holder if alive or his beneficiary now what this indicates is that in case of fraud you can reject within 3 years but after 3 years you can't reject in case of misstatement you can reject within 3 years but after 3 years you can't repudiate the bottom line is after a period of 3 years it will be very difficult for a life insurance company under a life insurance contract to repudiate a claim the test over here is now at the time of you know you you selling the product if you call it a selling of product if you want to you know pass on this product to the policy holder at that very stage only you need to carry out your investigations it can't be done at a later stage which is a usual practice in the insurance industry so in case of a repudiation is on the ground of misstatement because there's a difference between fraud there's a difference between fraud and misstatement uh in you know what is a misstatement the premium which has been collected in case the repudiation is on the ground of misstatement and not on the fraud uh made a statement which is a misstatement which is incorrect admittedly incorrect my claim gets repudiated within 3 years i am expected to now refund the entire premium to the insured this is again a amendment to section 45 which was not there earlier now under the present 45 section i am expected to refund the premium i'll reject the claim on if if it is on misstatement but i am also expected to now 
refund the premium collected to the insured or his representative or his nominee within a period of 90 days from the date of repudiation. So it is obligatory on the part of the insurance company now to rep if they repudiate on the ground of misstatement. But if it is on a ground of fraud, then there won't be any refund of premium. The claim gets repudiated. Again, I'm repeating, it. this has to be done within a period of three years. Now, a fact shall not be considered as material. Now, there's a clarification given in section 45 to you know, give some meaning to what is material fact. A fact shall not be considered as material unless it has a direct bearing on the risk undertaken by the insurer. So there has to be a direct, direct bearing on the risk undertaken by the insurer. And the onus is on the insurance company to show that if the insurer had been aware of the said fact, no life insurance policy would have been issued to the insured. Now I'll just give an example of this. If a person is suffering from some kind of ailment or he has undergone certain operations in past, which is a bearing on the risk because there is a likelihood of an early claim, he's, he's within his, it is within his knowledge that he's undergone an operation, then it is necessary for him to repudiate, uh, sorry, necessary for him to disclose it. And if he has disclosed it, there is no question of repudiation. But if he has disclosed, the insurance company have an option to then say that I will not like to issue a life insurance policy or I would like to charge you more premium, you know, uh, charge some premium, additional premium because you have a health issue. And therefore, it is important for everyone to understand that this section 45 has now been, you know, uh, considered as something very pro-consumer approach taken by the government and this statute also speaks for it, that 45 is the most important provision for re rejecting or repudiating a claim. Now, once we say 45, section 45 says that you are expected to now carry out the investigation at the time of insur you know, issuing the insurance policy or just prior to issuance of the insurance policy, or you can do it within the period of frame of three years. Even if there's no claim, I can still conduct an investigation into a policy which I have issued. And within three years, I can repudiate a question of policy. But once I cross the third year, I cannot issue, I cannot issue a repudiation letter. I cannot reject the claim of the claimant, though I find that there is a misstatement made over there. So three years is a milestone. Three years is a very important period and it can start from date of commencement of policy, commencement of risk, uh, revival of policy or date of rider, whichever is later. So 45 has certain you know, significance in terms of the amendment and this amendment is notified from 26th March 2015. So the contracts issued post 2015 March, this new law will be applicable and the contracts which are in existence already Possibly, let us say, there's a 20-year policy issued in 2011, which will mature in 2031. All right. And a claim occurs in 2024 or 23. It will be governed by the earlier, you know, the erstwhile section 45. But if the policy is issued post 26th March 2015, it will be governed by the new provisions of section 45, the amended sections of 45. So section 45 is a, a significant one in terms of consumer litigation because majority of the litigation arises out of section 45 and its applicability. But this is not applicable to a general insurance policy. This is applicable to life insurance policy. Certain basic principles such as uh, you know, utmost good faith and all those things are also applicable these principles to a general insurance contract, health insurance contract. But the rejection, the you know, the, the time limit for three years is only applicable to life insurance contracts. So let's move further on this. Now we have multiple products. If you see under life insurance, we have endowment policies, we have whole life policy, your money back policy, your ULIPS, you know, unit link insurance plan, we have investment plans, a combination of them. And therefore, there's always an issue of you know, a commercial purpose, which has always been taken by the insurance companies, that whether a ULIP plan attracts commercial purpose or not, you know, because is it, it is meant for investment. Of course, at the bottom line now, if it is indemnity, it is maintainable, they are consumer qua the insurance companies. Now, after 45, the second proviso, which is equally important, would be 
section 38 and 39 38 relates to assignment of policies and 39 relates to nomination though consumer forums or consumer commissions are not empowered to decide on who is a successor and who is you know those things are to be decided by uh, civil courts not by consumer courts but still there is always an issue of you know nomination in case of nomination who is entitled to receive certain amount obviously it is a nominee who is entitled to receive amount because this has been settled law by the supreme court way back in 1984 in the judgment of Sar uh, sarbati devi that nominee does not acquire any beneficial interest in the amount payable but payment made by the insurance company to the nominee will discharge the insurance company from all liabilities and therefore once the insurance company pays a pay you know releases the payment in favor of the nominee then it is discharged from all the liabilities but the but this amount which is paid to the nominee this can be claimed by the legal heirs in accordance with the law of succession obviously and therefore this law of succession and all will not be a consumer dispute the only issue would be that whether a payment made by rightly or wrongly to the nominee by the insurance company constitutes deficiency in service so this has been answered by the supreme court time and again and this is a settled proposition of law that any payment to nominee will discharge the insurance company from all liabilities however the nominee has to in turn distribute it to the legal heirs the legal heirs are entitled to claim against the nominee of course by filing a appropriate civil suit before a uh, court of jurisdiction uh, appropriate jurisdiction now where this comes in you know this rival claims there are two parties who are claiming the same insurance amount there are two wives a person has two wives both are claiming on the death of the husband of course there will be uh, you know both are entitled to money or any one is entitled to this insurance money mother in law and a daughter in law there is always a dispute these are you know frequent disputes which we see before the civil courts but in so far as insurance company the stand up insurance company is concerned they cannot you know be tried for deficient service because once they pay the amount to the nominee they are discharged from the liability now the third categorization in uh, in insurance act would be of health policies medical policies this is again a substantial litigation in consumer for us we see medical policies medical policies unlike the life policies is that a person who takes treatment in a hospital is entitled to indemnification of that particular hospital expenses as he has claimed and any rejection or shortfall in settlement of course he can approach the consumer commission for you know uh, his relief to claim that amount so again this the principles of insurance are also applicable over here but the embargo of 3 years is not applicable to medical and policies this is only applicable to life insurance policies they can repudiate the claim after 12 years 5 years 7 years of course which may constitute deficient service most important aspect over here is that insurance act section 114a provides that you know there is something called as a regulation framed by the ird and insurance act 114a empowers the regulator to frame such regulations and these regulations are extremely extremely important and therefore you cannot read insurance act in isolation it has to be read with irda regulations that is insurance regulatory development authority regulations and the most important regulations would be protection of policy holders it was 2002 now we have modified regulations of uh, protection of policy holders 2017 this gives timelines how a general insurance claim has to be dealt with what are the timelines within which you need to ensure that the claim is settled or repudiated we call it duty to speak they have to speak within the time frames and often we have seen that claims after 2 years or 3 years stand repudiated breaching those idea timelines and therefore these regulations are equally important i do vividly remember our former um, president of national commission just as mb shah had said in one of the seminars that every president every member of a consumer forum that time it was consumer forum now we call it consumer commission should have on his desk regulations framed by the irda while educating and hearing matters of insurance because these are of prime importance 
because these are the guidelines you know timelines been set by the regulator binding on the insurance company because often we see in a general insurance claim and an asset insurance claim that is there's a fire in a, in a factory the insurance company the regulation says within 72 hours a person called a surveyor has to come and assess the loss first primary visual inspections within the timelines of you know 30 days he has to six six months he has to issue a survey report and within that after that timeline within 30 days a claim is required to be settled there's a penal interest also been you know provided bank rate plus two percent as a you know uh, rate provided by the IRD. so these regulations matter a lot in case of a dispute alleging a deficient service against an insurance company so these regulations has to be read and these regulations are provided under standard and section 114a pursuant to these provisions of 114a the regulator has framed these regulations there are multiple regulations it's a big you know a, a huge booklet sort of where prominently you have to focus basically on protection of policy holders this is very important because these regulations uh, no, give certain rights. For example, this regulation also gives a right to a policyholder to ask for a survey report. You know, you can ask for a survey report once a policyholder has, you know, claimed a money under the Insurance Act, then he is expected to understand the survey report. For that, he can invoke the provisions of, you know, protection of policyholders regulation and ask for a survey report and the insurance company is duty bound to provide this survey report. Now, if you don't provide the survey report, if the insurance company fails to provide the survey report, then it constitutes one more angle of deficiency in service. So this has to be kept in mind because regulations are equally important in terms of deciding matters of insurance. Now, let us go further. Section 64 UM, a surveyor. Now, this is a third party who comes into picture in case, in, in case of a general insurance claim. Ideally, you know, it can be uh, you know, a claim under fire insurance, it can be an aviation claim, it can be a jewelers block claim. There are multiple contracts and multiple policies been issued to you know, a variety of policies under general insurance, unlike a life insurance. So life insurance has certain limitations with only certain features. Here is an asset insurance. An asset is destroyed. For example, motor insurance, not the third party motor, but an own damage claim. Uh, you know, uh, there's a damage to the vehicle. A surveyor comes into picture, he assesses a loss and the surveyor gives. The, the, the typical dispute is the surveyor has been prejudiced towards my claim and he has assessed a very meager loss. And that becomes a dispute before a consumer fora. And therefore, the consumer foras are expected to then educate on this. There will be bills, there will be bills which are disallowed by the surveyor, which has been affirmed by the insurance company. And therefore, the dispute has to be settled. Now, general insurance damage to assets you know insured under the perils covered under the policy these are tangible assets which are required to be assessed by the surveyor now what is the law on this the law says that if a loss proposed loss is above 1 lakh then it is mandatory on the part of the insurance company to appoint a surveyor section 64 um more particularly sub clause 4 it provides that if it exceeds 1 lakh then it is mandatory on the part of the insurance company to appoint a licensed surveyor. So it's not an in-house surveyor. It has to be a licensed surveyor who holds a license issued by the IRDA to assess that particular kind of loss. So he should be qualified to assess that particular kind of loss. Once he assesses the loss, he has to submit this report to the insurance company within the timelines fixed by the IRDA under the regulations. And the insurance company is expected to take a decision within 30 days of his issuance of the final survey report. Once he issues the final survey report, the insurance company has a duty to speak, either pay, partial pay, or reject the claim. You know, they can't hold on till uh, indefinite period. They have to decide this issue under Section 64 UF. Therefore, it is up to the insurance company whether to accept the survey report or reject the survey report. It's a it's a settled law by the Supreme Court that a survey report is no doubt an important piece of document, but it is not you know, a sacrosanct document. It is subject to challenge by the insured as well as the insurance company. A consumer can challenge it, an insurance company can challenge that report, and therefore it is not a binding. 
but no doubt it has a persuasive value you have to understand that a survey report or is a technical is usually is a technical expert and his report has some weightage but to deviate from that is another issue to deviate then the insurance company has to give reasons for why they want to deviate from the report but remember you cannot settle insurance company cannot settle a loss unless they obtain a report of a surveyor duly licensed by the irda if the loss exceeds 1 lakh prior to the amendment in 2014 the amount was 20000 rupees and if we look at section 64 um you know 64 um provides it doesn't de define any amount and that is why your regulations become very important to understand that we have to read the act and the regulations in tandem so no claim in respect of a loss which has occurred in india and required to be paid or settled in india you know an amount exceeding as specified in the regulations so the regulation provides for 1 lakh now earlier it was 20000 so once my loss exceeds more than 1 lakh i have to mandatorily appoint a neutral third person a licensed surveyor to assess the loss no doubt he may not be an employee of an insurance company and there was some kind of a controversy where insurance company were appointing their own employees as surveyors this was you know this now the issue is settled because uh, now do you have to appoint an independent professional who is a licensed surveyor by the irda the regulator so if a loss is below 1 lakh then the insurance company is justified in appointing the in house surveyor their own employees as a surveyor but if it exceeds 1 lakh in my opinion you have to appoint an independent professional a surveyor to who should be neutral he should assist you know the uh, the consumer as well as the insurance company to ensure that a quantification of loss for the purpose of indemnity is arrived at you now we have seen you know uh, multiple occasions that uh, you know surveyor's report is often challenged by a consumer before you know uh, consumer for us and uh, the consumer for us ultimately come to a conclusion after hearing parties that whether this constitutes a proper report or whether certain things were not done that is of course the sole discretion and jurisdiction of the consumer for us but 64 um is to be understood in the sense that 64 um provides for appointment of a surveyor a licensed surveyor and it becomes mandatory in certain circumstances which i have already informed you the next portion would be a uh, second surveyor now this is often again an issue which comes up before you know various uh, consumer commissions that insurance company is appointing first surveyor then is appointing a second surveyor then is appointing a third surveyor we have seen cases where five surveyors are appointed now whether it is permissible now the this this is not been answered by irda but irda had come out with a circular saying that you can't appoint a second surveyor now this was subsequently clarified by the supreme court in 2009 the judgment of venkateshwara syndicate that the proviso to subsection 2 in section 64 retains the right of the insurer to settle a claim for an amount different from that assessed by the surveyor therefore impliedly it permits the insurers to obtain a second or a further report but there is a caveat given by the supreme court that you cannot keep on appointing surveyors after surveyors you should find certain infirmities in the first report it should be there should be grounds of rejection of the first report then you can go to the second surveyor so that is that onus is of the insurance companies but there is a distinction between a preliminary surveyor and a final surveyor often these are two different persons because preliminary surveyor is a spot inspection in 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours i need to see as a surveyor ocular visual inspection of what how the loss has taken place because with passing time it becomes extremely difficult to visualize the loss how the loss has occurred what are the remains of the loss whether it has turned into ashes or there is there is something which can be salvaged so for that purpose an immediately a survey is appointed subsequently a final survey is appointed that is not a second survey but if a final survey report is issued then the insurance company is not as a matter of right can upon you know keep on appointing surveys after surveys we have seen cases where a survey is appointed and thereafter an investigator is appointed 
and thereafter again a server is appointed. Now this practice has been deprecated by the Supreme Court that you cannot, it becomes arbitrary. If you, if the rejection of the report, the first report is arbitrary based on no acceptable reasons, the courts or the other forums can definitely step in and correct the error. That is what the Supreme Court says. So the test is whether to accept that report or reject the report and what are the grounds of rejection or acceptance of such reports. And the Supreme Court has said that if the reports are prepared in good faith, due application of mind, and absence of any error or ill motive, then the insurance company is not expected to reject the report of the surveys. So that judgment is of really uh, of great importance because that really lays down that you can appoint a second surveyor subject to certain conditions. So the, 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 the question becomes that whether surveys are logical in their assessment and who is the best authority to open a real authenticate, authentic surveyor, you know? So this is a test which has to be passed by the insurance company when they keep on appointing surveys after surveys. This becomes extremely important. Now for that, again, why I say the regulation becomes important, there are surveyors code of conduct 2000 and surveyors code of conduct 2015, which defines the role of a surveyor, what the survey is expected to do. So these regulations become very important qua the definition service against the insurance company because ultimately a surveyor may be an independent person, but he acts as an agent of the insurance company. And if the insurance company accepts his report, then the test is whether we have to see that whether he has followed the regulations. If he has not followed the regulations properly, then this may constitute as deficiency in service on the part of the insurance company. Because ultimately, it's the insurance company who takes up the you know, report and he accepts the report and then acts on the report of the surveyor. So these are the provisions under the Insurance Act, which will be very significant. Now, rest of the provisions pertains to amalgamation, not necessary for consumer uh, assets, class of assets which the insurance company is expected to you know, invest into their uh, uh, solvency ratios. All these are matters beyond the you know, jurisdiction of consumer for us. What is important is, as I said, 45, we have section 64 UM, now, another section 64 VB, which is equally important is it deals with premiums. Once the insurance company receives the premium, the risk will start. So if I issue a check today, insuring my motor car, and the check is bounced as you know unpaid, then uh, this particular policy which I have issued will be treated as void ab initio. So 64 VB is applicable to general insurance, but it is not applicable to Life Insurance Corporation of India by virtue of Life Insurance Corporation of India Act 1956. We call it LIC Act 1956. Section 43 of LIC Act 1956 exempts them from applicability of Section 64 BB, but is applicable to all other companies. It is applicable more particularly in general insurance. Unless the premium is received in advance, there cannot be any liability on the part of the insurance company. Once they receive the premium, obviously they are liable. The treatment given under third party claim is completely different. It has now become more sort of an absolute liability because the concept of pain recovery has come in. And therefore, in consumer disputes, 64 VB, uh, 64 VB will be equally important for general insurance claims. But in case of LIC claims, they're exempted, obviously. Uh, you know, these uh, claims have been uh, adjudicated by consumer forums in cases of uh, involvement of 60, Section 64 VB because a premium is paid and the check is dishonored. And what is the liability of the insurance company before a consumer uh, commission? And these claims are not payable, subject to proof and evidence led by parties. The point over here is that if 64 VB is not applicable to general uh, life insurance company, then what about the private life insurance companies uh, who are issuing life insurance uh, into business of life insurance? So this uh, companies, it's a question mark, but in my opinion, the 64 VB stands applicable to them also. So they have to receive their premium in advance and then the risk commences, the risk starts. If you don't pay premium, no consideration, no contract. That's the basic principle we follow in insurance. So uh, 
to sum up 64 VB, it's an important provision under law insofar as consumer disputes are concerned because we have multiple cases wherein you know a check is given and a check is bounced and the claim occurs. For example, I issue a check today and the check comes written back after four days, let us say on 8th of June, in between there's a claim. What is the situation? Though, though the claim, the check, I, when I give an insurance check on the same day, probably they give me a cover note or some kind of, uh, you know, they will give me some kind of a policy copy, a schedule of the policy. That does not mean that that does not mean that you have you are expected to you know write on that particular contract and it is you know because there is a clause written over there if a check is found dishonored then this contract of insurance should be considered as void ab initio and therefore a policyholder cannot take advantage of that so one has to be very very really sure that the premium is debit credited to the account of the insurance company and debited from his account this is one now, uh, moving further, there's one more provision under the Insurance Act, which is Section 47. Now, 47 is usually not connected with the consumer litigation, but there were instances where parties tried to, you know, invoke consumer jurisdiction under Section 47. 47 is a very simple. 47 postulates that once there is an admitted claim, but I'm not able to identify a nominee. I'm not able to identify somebody who is entitled to this money. Nobody is coming forward to take this money. Then I can approach a court and deposit the money in the court. Once I deposit the money in the court, then, if, if, then I'm discharged from my liability. Now there's a separate proceedings you are required to file. You to issue notice to the other party. But possibly this cannot be entertained by consumer court consumer commissions because the word used under the act is court. So this is in case of rival claims. It happens every day. There are two parties who are claiming the same amount. So the best advice given to the insurance company is go to the court, deposit the money in the court. And the money can be invested by the court in a nationalized bank as is done by the Bombay High Court and by our state commission and district commissions. So this way, at least the liability of the insurance company stops. This is 47 which is, you know, not, it has been tested time and again, but usually it is civil courts who will have jurisdiction to try and entertain this kind of, because the word used under section 47 is application. You have to file an application, set out certain details, name of the policy holder, circumstances in which you propose to deposit this amount. And once it is deposited, then you are absolved from the liability as an insurance company. And then the legal heirs can take up the matter before that particular court. So reiterating, Section 45 will be extremely important. Section 47 will be important. 64 UM will be important. 64 VB will be also important. And most important will be the regulations. So this has to be read together because these regulations are very critical for consumer for us to understand if what are the deficiencies and if at all these allegations prove to be true, raised by the consumers before consumer courts, then to what extent the compensation can be awarded. And therefore, these regulations uh, become, you know, sort of a delegated legislation in my, in my opinion. And it is equally important to understand that how this, you know, regulations have to be applied in a particular case. For example, uh, you want to award interest. Uh, the consumer forum feels there's a deficient in service. And I want to, so the interest rate and interest factors are also given over there. It is bank rate plus 2%. So existing bank rate has to be searched and plus 2%. Of course, you are not bound by this, but these are guiding principles on insurance. One more aspect of regulations and notification of IRD is that there's a issue of accord and satisfaction. Often we see that a consumer signs a discharge voucher. He accepts the money. And thereafter, he approaches a consumer court for the balance amount, according to him, which is, is entitled. The regulator has given notifications in um, June 2015 and September 2016. There are two circulars been issued. Um, it's, it's the other way, it's September 2015 and June 2016. They say that a insurance company cannot force a consumer to sign a discharge voucher 
you can't compel a customer to sign a discharge voucher. If there's an admitted amount, please give him the amount, release the amount in his favor. Rest, let him fight out in the court if he wants to go to the court. So the practice of discharge voucher and then coming out and telling the court that look here, he has signed the discharge voucher and there's nothing due and payable will not possibly stand now in view of this circulars and notifications. These are important notifications issued by the regulator to all insurance companies and CEOs that you have to religiously follow this. Because the first circular was very clear in September 2015 that please don't force. And they have also made reference to various decisions of the Supreme Court saying they have deprecated this practice of obtaining discharge vouchers. But there is one area where we see that these discharge vouchers come to their rescue possibly after a gap. If a, in short, a consumer comes after a long gap before a court and claims his amount, then this can be a case of afterthought. It depends on facts of each case. But these notifications are equally very important. The second notification which came the very next year was the clarification given that, yes, you can't compel him. At the same time, let the court decide if he wants to go to court. Maybe a consumer forum or somewhere he wants to go and adjudicate on these issues. So he has a right. You can't stop him. This can be a defense. But you, under no circumstances, that you will force a consumer to accept this amount and make him sign a discharge voucher. The reason being, when you go for a claim before an insurance company, they say, I won't release the amount. First sign these dotted lines. First sign, execute the discharge voucher. Once you sign the discharge voucher, thereafter I will transfer the payment. In good old days, we had check payments. We used to issue checks or demand drafts. Now we simply transfer, fund transfer, wire transfer, RTGS. All right, it can be done. But under no circumstances, you can compel a consumer to execute a discharge voucher. That is what the regulator has said. There are circumstances, see, I'm generalizing it, because there will be facts and circumstances which will differ on case-to-case -case basis. There may be a genuine case for an insurance company may say that, no, this is properly explained to him. After explanation, he has signed the discharge voucher and he has taken the money. The test is if the, dis the payment comes after the discharge voucher, then there's a question mark. Then whether the consumer is entitled to his subsequent conduct will be very important to understand. So these are broad provisions I have covered under the Insurance Act who are consumer disputes. So, you know, the other provisions to my mind is not that uh, significant for consumer dispute because it essentially takes care of reinsurance and all other aspects. You know, what kind of loans and securities the insurance company is expected to do, what kind of accounts they are expected to do. The Insurance Act is very, uh, you know, comp comprehensive in terms of taking in, within its ambit various provisions. So the relevant provisions, the most important provision that I started was 45. The 45 is something which will be very significant for uh, members and presidents of consumer commissions who will be deciding these issues. Obviously, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but you can take this session as a warm-up session, uh, you know, sort of a, a crash course to understand how these insurance contracts are built in. And second aspect, a general aspect before I conclude my session is that contracts of insurance are sacrosanct. They are binding on parties. Each party is bound by this. And if an insurance company uh, you know, issues a contract, these are addition contracts. You know, what is this addition contract? Addition contract means take it or leave it. Insurance company is not going to change the contract for you. They are not going to delete a clause. At the most, they may delete a warranty or a condition. But the printed terms and conditions are made applicable to both the parties. And both the parties are bound by it. There's a landmark judgment given by our Chief Justice of India in 2019, two back-to-back -back judgments, where they explain elaborately the law of suppression of material facts and what are its consequences. I think a judgment in 2019 of Rekha Ben Rathor. I think it's a must read for everyone. You know, these judgments really you know, empower us also to understand how the law is. It, it is, it is something which really uh, you know, comes within us that what are the consequences of suppression of material facts? This was a case where the policyholder suppresses earlier policies, prior policies. Very innocuous to my mind, but still the Supreme Court took an exception to this and gave a very detailed reasoning. And they also borrowed certain judgments 
of um, foreign jurisdiction on what is the law over there. One more judgment which we have come across is, you know, whether uh, mosquito bite is, you know, an accident. And that's a well celebrated judgment where the National Commission held in favor of the consumer and the Supreme Court reversed it and dismissed the complaint. And there also they borrowed, uh, you know, certain literature from foreign jurisdiction saying that this is a law which is existing. So whether it is foreseen and whether you could have foreseen such kind of a situation. So the term accident has been defined. When there's a judgment of Alka Shukla, which is again from the Supreme Court of India, where again the nature of accident has been described, what is accident? And in detail, you know, explain the proposition of an accident qua an insurance contract before consumer. This is all consumer disputes which are taken up right till the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court had an occasion to deal with exhaustively these judgments. So overall, I believe these judgments are of also uh, will be really helpful to all of you because that, uh, you know, it doesn't talk about Insurance Act as such, but it does talk about Section 45 in terms of, you know, um, de deciding a matter, you know, judiciously. So with this, I think uh, I will conclude uh, my session. If you have any question and answers, feel free to uh, please raise your queries. Participants can raise their queries by putting it in your chat box. Now, there's one query I come across. Uh, I have one query that if a policy holder has given the nominee name in the insurance policy, but policy holder of the insurance policy and nominee both died in a car accident, so the heirs will be capable of to claim that policy. Yes. Because if the nominee pre-diseases or dies along with the policy holder, then of course it is by law of succession will apply. In which section can I apply my claim as per LIC Act 1956 and other laws? It is as per the, it's no, you don't require a section on this. 39 talks about nomination and section 39, you can say that the nominee and the policy holder both have died at the same time. And therefore as a, a lawful legal heirs, we are claiming this compensation. The response you may get from the insurance company would be, number one, get a succession certificate or they may ask you to claim, uh, give an indemnity bond. Succession certificate is the best thing they may ask for because airship is decided by civil courts. So another question is regarding the time limit for appointment of surveyor. Time limit for first survey is for the date of incident, it is 72 hours. Within 72 hours, insurance company is expected to appoint a surveyor. Yeah, I think that's it. Another is also regarding surveyor. If surveyor report is based upon stock available at the time of damage, compare with stock statement with the bank. Yeah, if the survey report is based on stock available at time of damage, compare it with stock statement with the bank. Yes, what is the question? But mm -hmm. uh, st bank statements are really an important piece of document stock statements. This is really that that has a persuasive value because ultimately your stock statements, uh, it's a do documented stock statement. So he has to correlate with the physical. Now physical is burned. You have to rely on the stock statements only. I'll repeat the important sections. Section 45, 47, 64 UM, 64 VB. I think somebody has already shared Venkatesh syndicate judgment. Very nice of him that he has shared this judgment. That will be very helpful in terms of second surveyor, appointment of second surveyor. Okay, you can explain about renewal of insurance policy. Now, renewal of insurance policy, if it is general insurance policy, it is always for an annual 12 months. All right, for 12 months, you have to go and ensure that you renew it before that. In case of death by drowning, it is taken as the onus is on whom. Obviously, the onus is on the insurance company if they propose to repudiate. Now, onus is on whom to prove it is accidental or suicidal. Insurance company, 
there has to be circumstances you lodge a claim your client may lodge a claim for this all right agents that is a very good question just a minute uh, agents of insurance company has misguided fill up incomplete information form so it is disclosed by proposer claim rejected see this is why you have to go through uh, justice chandrachur's judgment of rekha ben rathor or 2019 reported judgment which says that please remember one thing once an agent fills a proposal proposal form admittedly and use your client sign the proposal form then the agent is your agent not the com insurance company's agent so you have to be extra careful when you put your signatures though the form is filled by the agent <clears throat> mosquito bite judgment is uh, national insurance company versus mosami bhattacharya this is a good judgment which really gives a good exposition of law on what is accident insurance uh, see Uh, if you see when well, somebody has asked a question whether now the insurance act is pro consumer against i will say it is pro consumer section 45 has put complete in fact it has put uh, a noose around the neck of insurance companies you can't reject the claim after 3 years of life insurance claim can you imagine what kind of uh, you know more benefit you require i am trying to answer every question now one candidate has asked dear sir please advise on the adjudication process in insurance act there is no adjudication process as such in the insurance act it is an act which is ultimately governed by the contract of insurance what if the agent name registered with the insurance company and some other person acts on behalf that is a case of forgery and impersonation <clears throat> thank you doctor so what is covid and society is uh, the repeated questions please be very uh, detailed and i am not able to understand this provident societies I think the. Uh, Wait a minute. Huh? Yeah. Does wait a minute. Does printed terms and conditions of policy are voluntary of Section Thirteen of Contract as the consent is not free? No, they, uh, uh, sir, I respectfully disagree with this. Uh, printed terms and conditions are disclosed to a consumer before they enter into insurance contract. They cannot be termed as a voluntary of Section Thirteen. Yes, there is one thing which can be done now is it whether it amounts to an unfair contract under the new uh, regime of Consumer Protection Act. 2019 yes uh, thank you one so person has shared this is a very important judgment of rekha ben rathod on suppression of material fact this is from supreme court of india yes some
in just a minute. Huh? If a check is given and claim arises before the amount created, what would be the position? If your check gets, gets through, it realizes properly, then obviously the claim is admitted. Can I add one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, can, you, can you just point out two or three possible questions? I'm just saying possible questions which may be asked in the exam. Thank you. All right. Um, section, see, be sure of section 45. I think that is, uh, uh, you expect that uh, 45, under 45, you can get a question possibly that um, what happens if a claim is lodged after a gap of three years and the claim is repudiated, whether the insurance company is justified in repudiating rejecting this such claim. That is one. Number two, on renewal of policies, renewal of life insurance policies. Once the renewal of life insurance policy takes place and a proposer files a declaration of good health, whether that particular declaration of good health means a contract de novo or otherwise. And third question is, what is the time frame within which a insurance claim is expected to be settled under the regulations? It is the, the long uh, upper period is six months and you have to take a call. <clears throat> within six months, you have to settle the matter. Repeat the questions. Okay, section 45, if a claim is lodged after a period of three years from the commencement of the policy and the insurance company rejects the claim on any ground, on misstatement of fraud, whether they are justified in their actions. Number two, um, what is the time frame within which a general insurance claim is expected to be settled by the insurance company? Number three, what is a um, when a life insurance policy is lapsed and there's a renewal of life insurance policy and the proposer gives declaration of good health, whether that declaration of good health is to be considered as a contract de novo or otherwise. See, I'll explain you what is this. Initial proposal for my file, I take a policy. I don't pay premiums in time. My policy gets lapsed. Thereafter, I say, I go back to the insurance company and say, now I'll be regular. Please accept. They'll say, fill in this form. This is declaration of good health. Now, what is your present health status and uh, you know, finance status? I fill in. I give it to him. Whether my proposal, first proposal form is to be considered or second proposal form is to be considered for the purpose of admission of my claim, if any. Because the Supreme Court has said that uh, it is the first proposal form which is to be considered in Mithula Lakh's case, 1962. Yes, investment plans can now be taken to consumer court. See, the Supreme Court has given, paved a way now to a great extent. Uh, this judgment is authored by Justice uh, Rastogi and Justice C.T. Ravi Kumar on 13th April 2023. Have a look at that judgment. Uh, National Insurance Company versus Arsolia Motors. That is something really important. That has really opened, you know, in insurance, you can go to consumer courts now. Now, essay type questions, I am really not. Sir, essay, really, essay is already covered, sir. All right. Prior to this one uh, lecture was there for essay. All right, all right. I think that's it. And I could, to best of my ability, I would try to yes. answer your yes, questions. Absolutely. I am uh, very much thankful for you, sir, for being with us despite your busy schedule and uh, sharing your valuable knowledge with us and also for uh, resolving queries of the participants. I am also thankful for, uh, the, uh, to the participants for making this uh, session interactive. There is one more announcement. Uh, tomorrow also we are having another session which is, uh, which is an important subject. So be with us 
on uh, tomorrow sharp at 6 pm see you i request host uh, to conclude the meeting thank you sir